Tonight we're hosting James Spanner. James is a logistic dietitian and the chair of School of Family and Consumer Sciences at the University Eastern Illinois University. He got his PhD from University of Illinois at Urbana. And James is also the director of nutrition research with California Raisin uh, Board. And actually, at the end, we have some raisins for you. So <laughs> if you don't like this, it's you will. For sure, there are raisins at the end. <laughs> uh, also, if there are any questions, I was told that it's all right to talk during the presentation. And also, at the end, we're going to have a little Q&A. Uh, there's a microphone at the end. and. Uh, I'll help you put everything together. So please welcome James Spanner. So how many of you here because you have to be here and you signed in, your professor told you had to come? Be honest, raise your hand. You're supposed to be here. Oh, raise your hand. All right, then let me go the other way. How many of you here just because you want to be here? Yeah. Oh, I think you're lying to me. <laughs> you know? How many of you are here from the class I taught this morning? Anyone? Two people ought to give you a reward, you know, to listen to this twice. Of course, you'll, you'll see more. Uh, this is a talk I give all over the place. I was uh, in um, California day before yesterday, uh, giving a talk down in uh, San Diego. Uh, when, I, when I finish here, I have a talk in Chicago. I go back to Monterey, California the next day, and then I go to Italy on next weekend. Now, I, I take a food, wine, and fashion tour of Tuscany. Yeah, moan like you say, you mean it. <laughs> I, 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 this, this, I, it's full for spring break, and so I have 26 students going. But I also have a trip in June. We're going to talk about that later. And, uh, and I give this talk there. I come back, California Dietetic, Florida Dietetic, Michigan Dietetic Association. It goes all over. This kind of information is people are fascinated by it, and they just want to know. So this is what got me started in this. Oh, I don't know, about 10 years ago, I first saw this thing on um, obesity. So what this is, here, this is the United States 20 years ago, 1990, and obesity was less than 15%. Look what happened in the, in the next 20 years. Can you see over there? Want me to throw this thing out of the way? Are you all right? OK, all right. 91, it jumps to 15 to 19, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, it jumps to 20, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, it jumps to 25, 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, it jumps to 30, 2006, 2007. Is that amazing to you? That amazes me that, and, and the thing is, I saw this 10 years ago, and I thought, certainly we're going to be able to turn this thing around. You know, really? It just, all you got to do is, don't do this. You know, it's pretty easy. And we're getting fatter faster. And so, that is over the past 20 years. We're not the only country to be obese. Here is uh, the United States at 34, but here's a Kuwait at 41, and American Samoa at 66% obesity. You're moaning out there. 66% obesity. Why are those people so heavy? Culture? That's, kind of, that's close. What else? Diet? It's the American part. <laughs> Samoa was in great shape before we got there. Now look at Kuwait. I have a, I have a handful of students from Kuwait, graduate students from there, and uh, their obesity rate is 41%. Why is it that they're so having a problem over there in, in Kuwait? What? Women can't exercise. <laughs> Women can't exercise to get all that garb on, yeah. <laughs> that could be it. And you can't see what people look like anyway, so you don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so why is it that they're so heavy? <laughs> Advertising. What, what else? They used to have to chase rabbits down the desert, knock them over the head, and eat them. And now there are a million Kuwaitis and a million people that serve them. And all my students that come from there never do anything. They don't have to. They have servants to do everything. And so you think we're sedentary. They're really sedentary because they've got money. Now, we could just stop the uh, presentation right now because I hate to be proud about this and, and to be boastful, but I do have the answer. Spray you thin. <laughs> it really works. Lose weight, control your breath, and, and fresh your breath at the same time. So 
how do you know it works? It says right here, it works. <laughs> it's amazing to me that that's even sold. Isn't it funny? So why are Americans gaining weight then? Fast food? We have to exercise less. That's right. We have to exercise less to get around. Screen time, yeah. Portion size. Portion size, lack of motivation. Why do you eat? Advertising? Social boredom. Social boredom. There you go. I knew you were out there. So I think that's true. These, all these things on the list have to do with obesity. I do not think they have much to do with the obesity epidemic. And I'll explain why. But lack of exercise and sedentary lifestyle. Most of you, as I look across this room, were not around 20 years ago, hardly. But we were sedentary in 1990, and we're sedentary today. We haven't changed that much in sedentary lifestyle, though that has to do with obesity. Stress and pressure. Uh, is it, are we under more stress now than we were 20 years ago? Do you really think so? Here's my example I give all the time, and hopefully it'll change your mind. Uh, when I was a kid in Syracuse, New York, we would have bomb drills every Tuesday because we were the fifth place on the continent that was going to be bombed by the Soviets. And so we would, 10 o'clock would come, bell comes off, we dive into the bathroom and dive onto the floor, and they say, put your head down. Where? Under the urinals. Really? And they say, yes, and I put my head down. And they say, put your hands over your head, but then my cheek will be in the sticky stuff. And they say, put your hands over your head. <laughs> and I remember as a little kid, just shaking there, you know, because the bomb, we're going to get bombed. And they would remind us of it every Tuesday, you know, that we were going to get killed. <laughs> And I'm telling you, I was a stressed kid. I had ulcers when I was 15. You know, I don't have any ulcers anymore because things are good. We have Obama now, we're fine. <laughs> don't you worry. Advertising. Do you eat because of advertising? Yes. Yeah, so do I. But you know, advertising was good 20 years ago, same as it is today. Genetics. Are people heavy because of genetics? Yes. Has it changed? Have your genes changed in 20 years? Ladies? No. Have your genes changed? <laughs> no one's brave enough to talk about their genes, apparently. <laughs> so, all these things have to do with obesity. Deep emotional needs, Dr. Phil. Now, do you eat when you're stressed? Yes. Yeah, I do too. So you've got a test the next day and you're supposed to be studying. What do you end up doing? Eating. Eating. You know, <laughs> you're good. This is, this is an active group. But my question is, are we just more emotionally needy now? I mean, in 1990, we have it all together. Man, we got it together, and we know what's going on. And now we go, I don't know what to do. I just don't know anymore. I mean, have we lost that ability to cope? <laughs> so all of these things, and this one, haven't found the right diet yet. All these things have to do with obesity. My premise tonight for the next 42 minutes is going to be is this. And, and, and hopefully, I'll convince you of this by the end. We lose track of how much we eat and we eat more. Now, I have five reasons for this that we're going to go through tonight and explain it to you, and hopefully you'll agree with me. Now, I have an example for this. Losing track. Thinking one thing, but something else is true. We think we understand what we eat. We do not. You know, I was in, uh, in England, and I sat down at the table. I had my blue shirt and my khaki pants on. I said, I got my blue shirt and my khaki pants on. I'm ready to work. And the lady at the table turned beet red, and her husband said, come here. And they had a little one-year-old sitting there at the table. And I said, what? He said, come here. He said, you're wearing tan pants. Fine. He said, when our little baby messes its diaper, it has a khaki diaper. What you really said is you pooped your pants at my breakfast table. <laughs> oh, really? That's what I said? He said, don't say that anymore. OK, fine. You know, one time in my dietetics program, uh, the doctor ordered half milk, half molasses. And so I would always test out the drinks before I sent them out to the floor. And I tested it out, and I yucky, and I took it up to the nurse. I handed it to her, and I said, this is horrible. What is this stuff? And she turned beet red. I said, oh, what? She said, it's not a supplement. It's an enema. <laughs> How many of you out there have consumed an enema from this end? <laughs> we think we know what we're doing, but we don't. Remember, that's the premise tonight. So there was this little girl. She was praying, God bless mommy, daddy, grandma, and grandpa. And then one day she's praying, God bless mommy, daddy, and grandma. Goodbye, grandpa. And the dad says, well, what would you say that for, honey? She said, I don't know. Next day, Grandpa dies. Whoa. She's praying along a few days later, God bless Mommy and Daddy. Goodbye, Grandma. And he said, Honey, why'd you say that? She said, I don't know. Next day, Grandma dies. 
You can imagine how upset he was a few days later. She's praying, God bless mommy, goodbye daddy. Goodbye daddy. He panics. He can't sleep all night. He gets up in the morning. He doesn't go out for lunch. doesn't go out for dinner. Midnight comes. He's alive. He goes home and says, dear, you have no idea how bad my day was. She said, you had a bad day. The mailman died on the porch this morning. <laughs> oh, come on. So in case you didn't get that, he thought he was her father, but he wasn't. <laughs> so we think we know what we're doing, but we do not. That's the premise. Let's hit it five things very quickly. Portion size is number one. This is my great niece, Rachel. As you can tell, she doesn't exercise very much. But whether she dines at home or whether she eats out, she always eats the right portion, and that's how she keeps her slim, trim figure. <laughs> Isn't that cute? It's a baby. Okay. <laughs> so, it doesn't matter what we're talking about, they're bigger now. So, you look at Hershey bars, and they were one ounce, two, four, now they're eight ounces. So, the original Hershey bar was only that big. It was 0.6 ounces. And now it's bigger, and we don't know it. We don't realize it. Here's the bagel 20 years ago compared to today. 140 calories, now 350. How, and, and people, what's funny about this is it's an odd food to me, the bagel. People think it's a healthy breakfast. What did you have for breakfast? I had a bagel. <laughs> really? Yes. Pretty good for me. <laughs> How many calories in a slice of bread? 80, 90, 70. So this is how many slices of bread? Four or five? So you asked me, what would you have for breakfast? I had five slices of toast this morning for breakfast. <laughs> You'd say, you're kind of a pig, aren't you? Five slices? But we think we're doing good when we say this. We get fooled by portion. Now, how many of you eat a dry bagel? Oh, my goodness, there's an overly really high percentage of dry bagel eaters in Iowa. <laughs> how many? Raise your hands really high. See how many? Usually there's two or three. There must be 20 of them out there. All right, besides you, you different people, what do most of you put on a bagel? Cream cheese. cream cheese. And the funny thing about it is you do this. You take a big wad of cream cheese and you go, whoomp, lump, bummer. It only made it a third of the way around. You take another big wad, boom, whoomp, bummer. It's not a, you take another big wad, so you've got this big lumps of cream cheese around this bagel. How many calories is that bagel then? Two million. Two million. Yeah, that's close. 600 calories. Now, so you have a 600-calorie breakfast, and you think you haven't had hardly anything. What did you have for breakfast? Oh, not much. A little bagel. That's it. <laughs> and so the burger used to be 300. Then it went to 600. Now there's a monster burger. It's 1,420 calories. Now, there was one guy in class that had eaten one of these things, and I had a discussion with him later. Who here has eaten one of these burgers? You have. Oh, my goodness. Raise your hand. How many were you? Did you raise your hand? You've had a monster burger? <laughs> Are you kidding? And you're still alive. You feel good? And how about you? Not recently? And he's still alive. You know what? Honestly, I must say, I have eaten one once, but it was only for scientific and research purposes. <laughs> Did I eat it? And I only had one once, actually. A lot of new money has been made on old ideas. Sneakers were around a long time before Nike rewrote the rules. And has any American food been reinvented more than the hamburger? First McDonald's, cheaper and smaller. Then the escalation of the burger wars, larger, fancier, fatter. Now the latest entry, one burger with enough calories to feed a family of three. Here's NBC's Kevin Tibbles. In the beginning, there was simply the burger and the bun. Do you ever wonder why Burger Chef hamburgers taste better? But with competition, things got complicated. Hold the pickle, hold the lettuce. Now, Hardee's has thrown down the burger gauntlet, serving up what it calls the $5.49 monument to decadence, the monster thick burger. Here's how they build it. Two-thirds of a pound of beef, 664 calories. Three slices of cheese, 186 calories. Four pieces of bacon, 150. Mayonnaise, 160. Butter, 30. And How do you feel now? <laughs> yeah? I think you're too little to eat one of these. You probably have one. Did you have one of those? Did you have one of those? They're at Hardee's. Uh, you, you're sure now? Okay, all right. 
Now, why do you think they put the butter? Think this is the greasiest, fattiest thing that man has ever created. Let's put a pat of butter on it. <laughs> why did they do that? To grill the bun. Now, look at this. This has three slices of cheese, four slices of bacon. Now, what amazes me is they're using breakfast as a condiment. They put four slices of bacon on there like they put on mustard. A little mustard, four slices of bacon, sure. <laughs> I want to play a little bit and more And a of bun, this. 230. A mass of 1,420 calories with 107 grams of fat. If you're the romaine lettuce, raspberry vinaigrette crowd, this is not your burger. Compared to other burgers on the block, the Monster's got twice as many calories as McDonald's double quarter pounder with cheese. Wendy's classic triples, a lightweight with only 940 calories. And Burger King's double whopper with cheese falls short with just over a thousand. Just one Monster Thick Burger carries nearly half the calories recommended daily for teens and adults. And if you're a sedentary woman, it's almost your entire daily allotment. This is a heart attack in a bun. Michael Jacobson of the Center for Science and the Public Interest bites back. These thick burgers are quintessential food porn. Just <laughs> now how do you feel? You've eaten food porn. <laughs> ah, you like it? You still like it, huh? Okay. All right. Okay. Now when someone eats that burger, do you think they say, give me the small fry with that? So the large fry, 600 calories. That's 2,000 calories. And how many calories in a large McDonald's milkshake? 1,000 calories. 1,100 calories in a large McDonald's milkshake. So that makes this a 3,000 calorie meal. Now remember my point tonight is this. We lose track of how much we eat. You eat 3,000 calories. And you think, you know, you get full after you eat this. But then six hours later, you're not so full anymore. And you have dinner and you think, you know what? I remember I had a big burger for, for lunch. I think I'm going to cut back a little bit and not have any dessert for dinner. And you need to skip dinner. <laughs> skip breakfast. Skip the next day at lunch and don't eat till dinner. Just to make up for 3,000 calories you ate. So here's the uh, Monster Burger, or the Riley Burger. It is, it is three and a half pounds of burger. It's seven one-half pound burgers. Yeah. Not only at fast food, but when you get to the regular restaurants, still portions are double. And the thing is, you know they're bigger, don't you? You know, you go out and you eat and you think, I don't feel well when you get done. This is too much. But we eat it anyway because it's in front of us. You know, there's a whole other talk that I give on, on really uh, our mechanisms in our brain why we do this. And it's just phenomenal why we do stuff like this, but it doesn't fit into this talk right now. Um, but the thing is, is that whatever's in front of you, that's a portion. So then there is the combo meal, a value meal. Is it a value to get more of something that you did not need in the first place? <laughs> is that really a value? Even if it's 25 cents. You know what? I was in Atlanta getting stuff for my kids, and I went to uh, Chick-fil-A, and I bought them burgers or whatever. And they said, would you like to supersize that or, portion, or value that? No, no, I was fine. I don't need a combo meal. And they said, it's free. <laughs> Are you kidding me? It's free. Yeah, we'll give you the Cokes and all the fries for nothing. I said, you people are evil. <laughs> and, I, and I took it home, you know, because it was free. <laughs> But here's my idea of, of a of value meal. So you're going to hang a picture, your nail is this big, you go to the store, your hammer's this big, you're checking out and the person says, oh, do I have a deal for you? You can get this sledgehammer, 25 cents more. <laughs> no, really, the nail's only this big. But look at the value and you go, yeah, value. <laughs> so you buy this big thing, you take it home, put a hole in the wall, bloody your thumb, doesn't even work, you lose the nail. So what value is it to get more of something you didn't need in the first place? Here's what you get with a value meal, an extra 600 calories. How many of you woke up in the morning saying, you know what, it's been a bad week, but if I could find 600 calories cheap, <laughs> that, would, that would really make my day. <laughs> okay. The Toll House cookie, it's, it's almost twice as big as it was before, and you don't know it. So even when you're making things at home, the Toll House cookie recipe, it's bigger, and you don't know it. How many of you have seen Super Size Me? Okay, what was this goal in Super Size Me? 
30 days and nothing at McDonald's. And what did the guy making the film want to prove? How bad his health How bad his health became? His body almost shut down. That's true. His liver was about dead. There was a little tombstone at the end. It had something written on it. What was his goal? He wanted to kill McDonald's. How healthy is McDonald's? Did he kill him? Do you feel sorry for McDonald's because they're so puny out there right now? Isn't it sad how they just can't flourish anymore? What's the one company that has grown every single quarter through this recession? McDonald's. So I had watched that video coming back from Europe four or five years ago or something, and I, and I was sitting down with my wife, and we were having a, a Subway salad, all spinach, five vegetables, tuna on top. And I said to my wife, this is the healthiest thing I can eat, and it's fast food. Fast food's not bad. Bad fast food's bad. And I told my wife, I said, you know what I'm going to do? I am going to feed you fast food for 30 days. And I'm going to watch you breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I'm going to give you the right portion to eat. I'm going to tell you what to eat every day. And we're going to film you the whole time to show people it can be done. What'd she say? Oh, please. What'd she say? She said, I am so tired of you turning everything we do into an experiment. <laughs> Why can't we just eat like normal people? And I said, because we are not normal. <clears throat> and she said, get a couple of students. Yes. So I got Aaron and Ellen out of my graduate class. And I fed them fast food for 30 days. And uh, the CBS Morning Show liked it so much, they invited us out to uh, New York. And uh, we did a little video uh, at the CBS Morning Show. And I'm going to show you a piece of it. We continue our special series this morning with a look at ourselves. To put it quite simply, we are a nation of overeaters. But the good news is there's some simple things that all of us can do about it. And early show consumer correspondent Susan Copeland has details. Good morning, Susan. Good morning, Hannah. Believe it or not, you can eat fast food, chocolate, candy, and cookies and still shed pounds. You are about to meet a professor who says it all comes down to something very simple, portion control. Pizza, burgers, fries. We think they're the enemy in the Battle of the Bulge, but maybe not. Yes, you can eat all those things and lose weight. New now, I interviewed with them for an entire day. And the one thing they pull out of that, yeah, you can eat all that. Eat all whatever you want. You, know, you can eat anything you want. Uh, they did better after this, but when I f first saw this, I thought, oh my goodness, they're going to tell, tell the whole world that I tell people to eat junk food. But they did better. Nutrition expert Jim Painter says it's not so much what you eat, but how much you eat. He proves it in his documentary, Portion Size. Watch Aaron eat this piece of pizza. he puts two of his Look students on a 30-day fast food oh. diet. They both ended up losing a couple of pounds. Their blood cholesterol levels dropped. Their blood lipids stayed normal. Their liver enzymes stayed normal. Everything was fine if they ate the right portion. And this was eating fast food it was every eating day. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And they ended up losing weight. But getting the right portion size is getting harder. Painter showed us how portions have ballooned. This is a Caesar salad from 20 years ago versus today. Double the portion, double the calories. And same with the pasta and the meatballs. Same with the pasta and meatballs. Now, if you just say, give me the regular serving, it's going to be almost twice as much. And just look at a regular burger and fries from the 50s compared to now. But don't you think people want this? They don't they really want do. that. They really do. And so one of the problems is, is that we have this idea that more is better. And if you look at people's waistlines, they are more now. Uh, and it's not better. But is it possible to eat smaller portions and still be satisfied? Painter says yes. And to prove his point, he helped us set up an experiment. Ice cream. We invited this group of people to take part in an all-you-can-eat ice cream taste test. Take as much as you want. Um, if you want to come back for seconds, you can come back for seconds. We started by splitting them into two separate groups. Group A was given a big scoop, big bowls, and big spoons. Group B was given a scoop, bowls, and spoons about half the size. As a result, Group A took huge portions and piled on the toppings. Once we weighed each bowl, they chowed down. Everyone in this group ate quickly. Most even came back for seconds. But watch what happened when we brought in Group B, the ones with the smaller bowls. They filled their dishes, but with smaller spoons, it took them more time to get to the bottom, and most quit after only... <laughs> I felt so sorry for this guy. I went up to him and I said, do you want more ice cream? He goes, no, I'm fine. And I said, really, you're a big guy, you probably want some more ice cream, don't you? He goes, no, I'm fine. I said, really, you must, he goes, no, really, Dr. Payne, I'm fine. 
we brought the bowls out. He saw I had a little one. He said, Dr. Painter, you cheated me. I said, no, I didn't. You cheated me. And I said, I asked you three times if you want more ice cream. He said, I want more ice cream. Fine. You're a big guy. I'll give it to you. And so he, he had more ice cream. But he was fine until he saw that someone had a bigger portion than he did. We are funny humans. One serving. Does everybody feel like they ate enough ice cream? Yes. 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 Then we revealed the truth of our experiment and the results. <laughs> Even though both groups told us they were completely satisfied, Group A, the one with the bigger bowls and spoons, ate twice as much as Group B. Are you surprised that you guys ate double what they ate? Absolutely, mm -hmm. and I can definitely see how just the size of the, of the bowls did it. That's a very good point. The size of the bowls made a difference. This next lady, what she says is her answer, is exactly what I would have wanted her to say, and it's absolutely perfect. Why do you think your group ate less? Well, I guess because when you see that your bowl's full and then you eat everything in there, you feel that you had enough and that's all that you need. Jim Painter says... The that is, very, that is so good. That's one of the keys. We're going to get to these in just a moment. But one of them is what you have in front of you, whatever size it is, when you eat that, you feel like you have had enough. One more little piece of this. The lesson is simple. Control your weight by controlling your portion size. What is the appropriate size? I don't think you need to make a, a big calculation. And I tell people this, and I'm really serious about this. Reach down and grab your side. <laughs> if there's more there between your thumb and your index finger than you want, think small and choose small. Yes, I have that problem. Painter. Don't do that now, Susie. You're pregnant. You're eating for two. Painter, what do you have here? Well, Painter says that choosing small can be as easy as downsizing all of your plates, bowls, and glasses. So here's a look at the dinner plate that I normally use at home. It's huge. So I'm downsizing to this plate. Okay. You know what? We actually did that in our house. And did it work? Yeah, of course it works. Because yeah, you put does. the same amount of food and it looks like it's, it's full on the Absolutely. plate. Absolutely. He has some other great tips. He's such a funny personality, too. He says you should write everything down, right? Yeah. She never even met me. She doesn't even know who I am. <laughs> I asked Susan Copeland, I said, can I use you as a poster child? Because I went and then I came back the next summer. I did another little show and she had lost 40 pounds. I said, 40 pounds, that's great. And she said, well, 20 was the baby. <laughs> but she said, I lost 20 pounds after that just by doing the five things you told me to do. Really? And so uh, then I was there a couple years later and she said, oh, I gained five pounds. I said, oh, I'm sorry, that's okay. And she said, well, I'm pregnant. <laughs> Point number two, even the shape. So am I even beginning to, to convince you yet that we lose track of how much we eat, and portion is one of the reasons it does it. But there's other things besides that. Even the shape of a container will fool you. Uh, when you buy things at the grocery store, if it is a small or a medium or a large package, doesn't matter whether it's Crisco or spaghetti or M&Ms, if you have a large package, you pour more out of it when you get home. So when you're in the grocery store, if you buy large packages, when you get home, you will eat more and you do not know it. Brian, my good buddy, who's read Brian Wansink's book, Mindless Eating? A few of you? Four or five of you? Okay, so Brian did this little study um, about popcorn. You can see how big the containers were. And when he had a large container, people ate about 60 grams. You gave him a huge container, and they ate 90. So the container in front of you that you're sticking your hand into, the bigger it is, the more you will eat. Brian did a funny study once. He, he had people, he's at Cornell, and, and he, he had people come and they'd get a plate of, of food and they'd weigh it, and the server would take it out and go, uh, I'm you. Oh, I'm so sorry. You have to get more food. They would go back and they'd get a smaller plate the next time they went back, and they'd fill it up. And then he said, do you think you ate more the first time or the second time? And they said, you know, we saw that you gave us a smaller plate. And you know what? Uh, I ate more. And he said, no, you didn't. You ate less every single time. Every time you had a smaller plate, people put less on it, thinking they had more because the plate was smaller. Now, how good is popcorn the next day? Do you like it? Has it lost its crispness? Is it a little soggy and gummy? Is it? How about 10-day-old popcorn? Now, these were intelligent people, and you gave them 10-day-old popcorn, and they ate about 40% less. But if you gave them a bigger bucket, they ate about 40% more. <laughs> Ten-day-old nasty popcorn. 
And if you give people more, they will eat more. You know, I asked about this. And I said, Brian, how is this even possible? And he said, you know, when you have this good taste in popcorn, people would finish all they could eat before the movie started, you know, because it's so, you eat it all and eat it more. But he said, when you had the bad stuff, people would take a bite and go, oh. And then they'd wait five minutes and go, yuck. And then eat another one five minutes later and go, oh, that's not so good. And then eat another one and go, man, that's so bad. And then eat another one, oh, what the heck. And they would eat it. He said they would eat it like throughout the entire two hour movie. They're just gradually eating this popcorn. And if you have a bigger container, you eat more. Just because the container's big. And we don't know it. So, point number two size and shape of container makes a difference. Which line looks bigger? This one. We perceive this more than we perceive this is Piaget's principle. And so Brian gave these uh, kids a tall glass and a fat glass and said, pour eight ounces. And this is what happened. When he said pour eight ounces, when you had the tall glass, it started filling up fast and people stopped at about five, thinking they had poured eight. When you had the short fat glass, people kept pouring and pouring and pouring. And they ended up pouring almost 10 ounces, thinking that they'd poured eight. They were fooled by the shape. Who in the world should not be fooled by the shape of a glass? Who would know how to pour a glass correctly? Bartenders. Bartenders, correct. You know, I asked that question, and I was at a regional meeting of the Southwest or Southeast, and, and no one came up with anything. They wouldn't say bartender. And then I said, oh, oh I, I know what's happening here. See, in Illinois, if we want alcohol, we have to go to a bartender and buy it. You people make it in your backyard. <laughs> Sheesh. So this is what happened. You know, they laughed, but they, weren't, they were not happy about that when I said that. So if you have the tall tumbler, you have inexperienced or experienced, they pour it about right at one and a half ounces. You get it right. If you're inexperienced, you overpour by almost 0.75. If you're experienced, you still overpour, but not by as much. So when you go to the bar, what do you want? Short, fat glass, right? What else do you want? Inexperienced bartender. <laughs> if you own the bar, what do you want? You want experienced bartenders and these tall glasses that make them pour it right. You know, really, these people do this for a living. I mean, they do it night after night after night, and their business depends on pouring it right, and they still miss it. Point number three, so size and shape fools you. You know, how important is it, is it with food is sitting in front of you? I always wondered, if you have food sitting out, how much more do you eat compared to if it's put away? And uh, I had a student look in the literature and, and found nothing. So we've run a few studies uh, in the past couple of years. And this is the first one. We gave candy kisses on the desk, in the desk drawer, and away from the desk. And this is what happened. When we had candy kisses on the desk right here, people ate about nine. When we put them in the desk drawer, people ate about six. So moving it from here to here decreased consumption by 30%. And they didn't know it. How many of you have ever wanted to lose weight and would like to lose, oh, 30% and not know it? <laughs> yes, see? Now, the interesting thing is here is uh, if we made it inconvenient, people only ate uh, three. And the inconvenient part was people had to stand up and get it. <laughs> Decreased consumption by 60%, just moving it to a cabinet near them. Have you ever done this? I mean, I one time, I wanted Oreo cookies real bad, and, and I said, you're a bad wife, buy me Oreo cookies. He goes, no. And I, and I go to the next week, I want Oreo cookies, no. And I went for a month. And then I looked in the top shelf on the back, and there they were the whole time. I didn't eat any of them, because they were out of sight. Brian did a little study where he put ice cream in the front of the fridge and the back of the fridge. And it, consumption decreased drastically, moving it 12 inches. Because you're hunter-gatherers. You go home, and you open up the fridge. And you start looking through the fridge for stuff to eat. I need something to eat. And you go looking for it. And if you don't find it, you don't eat it. OK. So we did this same study with grapes, chocolate, carrots, and pretzels. And so when we moved it from here to the top of the desk, we increased consumption by 15, 25, 40%. Why are carrots so much more of an increase than chocolate? They're visible and bright. They're visible and bright. What else? 
healthy? This is my idea. I mean, how many of you wake up in the morning at, at 4 o'clock and you're going, I am starved. I have been craving a carrot all day. <laughs> you know, do you have a carrot? I saw you eating carrots yesterday. Can I have one of your carrots? <laughs> and so <laughs> if, it's, if it's chocolate, we find it. You know, we're going to go search for it until we get it. If it's carrots, we'll eat it if it's out there. But if it's not there, we forget about it. We did a little study a couple of weeks ago. I had to go out and give a talk to the sun-made raisin growers, all 700 of them. And so I did a little study with raisins, so I'd have something to say about raisins when I got there. And so we put raisins uh, in the desk drawer, and people ate about two boxes a day. We put them on, five boxes on the desk, and they ate about two and a half, three boxes a day. Instead of five boxes, we put 10 boxes on their desk. They ate three, three and a half a day. It increased by 40% when we put them on the desk, made them visible, and had more of them. This is a good thing for eating healthy. Do you really want to eat more fruits and vegetables? You know, I don't have a, this is not the talk, but I have an entire talk on phytonutrients and health, reducing heart disease by eating fruits and vegetables. And it is so good for us. How many of you actually get the right number of servings of fruits and vegetables? You know? Raise your hands and see how many here there are. Embarrass me again. Okay, there's 10 of them. Now the rest of us, poor us. We can eat more fruits and vegetables if we make them visible and then make them convenient. If you don't want to eat it, invisible, inconvenient. Number four. So we've got now, I think, that we get fooled to eating more. Portion does it. Shape and size does it. And visibility does it. But visual cues, to me, is a key. Brian did this little study with chicken bones and beer bottles at Jillian's Bar in uh, Champaign-Urbana. And so there was a table here, uh, and there was a table you know, three feet away right here. And on this table, they cleared the beer bottles and the chicken bones throughout the whole uh, football game. And on this one, they let the beer bottles and chicken bones pile up. Which table ate more? The one that was cleared. These people said, do you want another beer? And they went, three, two, five? How many beers I have? Give me another one. They ate 30% more, drank 30% more. This one, you want another beer? Uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six beers. I better stop. When you lose track of how much you eat, you tend to eat more. So we did the little ice cream study that we just showed you. Um, and we did it again on uh, national television. You know, I went to New York, and I'm laying there in bed the night before the interview. And then all of a sudden, it hit my mind. What if the experiment doesn't work? I spend all day, Dr. Perry says, do this, do this, do this, do this. And oh, by the way, we did an experiment. It didn't do anything. Oh, bummer. So I couldn't sleep all night. And I'm laying there going, what if it doesn't work? So that's when I took the small spoon and I made it really small. <laughs> and so here, this is the experiment we did with, with ice cream. We had a group of people coming through um, in a faculty meeting. And we gave them bigger bowls, smaller bowls. Sure enough. People ate uh, considerably more when they had the larger bowls. This is me. <laughs> I really don't know who this is, you know? But I know she's somebody that you should know. And so Shape Magazine last October did a little uh, thing, and they called me up, and they said, the amount of food on a plate, whether it is one helping or four, is what most people consider a normal serving. That's exactly right. And so whatever you choose to put in front of you, that's what you're going to eat. And once you've made that choice how big it is, you don't have a choice after that. You're going to eat it. Now, Better Homes and Gardens did this little thing and said, and they wrote a story, and they interviewed me once, and they, and they said, and they quoted it, said, Dr. Painter says, little candies are evil. My daughter-in-law called up and said, you know what, you sound stupid. I said, I know, I know. It's like this. Smoking's bad, cussing's bad, and little candies are evil. <laughs> and I even thought, this guy sounds like a wacko. I'm not sending my kids there. What I said was this. When you eat a candy bar, whether it's this big, this big, or this big, when you finish the candy bar, you finished. It doesn't matter how big the bar was. Because when you finish it, isn't it an odd thing? You get a candy bar, you eat it, and all of a sudden, the universe comes together, and you are full at the same time the candy bar's done. Isn't that amazing? You know, what told you you were done? The candy bar did. So when you finish, rarely do you eat a candy bar and go grab another one. It's just rare to do that. You grab a candy bar and eat it, and you're done. You may eat one an hour later or two hours later or next day, but you stop. What I said was, you know those little candies that are this big? 
Do you ever eat them? You know the little bite-sized candies, whatever they are, Snickers, whatever. Have you had those? Okay, what I said was, you eat a couple of those in a day, and, and they're on your table, and you have five or ten, and someone says, have you had anything today? No, I haven't had anything to eat. Just a couple of candies. And you have five, ten, fifty, a hundred. What did you have for today? Well, really nothing, a couple of candies. End of the day, you have six, eight hundred, a thousand candies, and go, you know, I fasted all day. I just had a couple of candies. <laughs> and so what I said was, I said, little candies are evil because they don't tell you how much you've had. That's pretty intelligent. People would have read that and go, this guy's intelligent. I'm sending my kids to Eastern Illinois. But they read that other one and thought, this is stupid. So, my point is this. The portion that is set in front of you, whether you put it there or somebody else, whatever ends up in front of you, that is what you're going to eat, and that is what's going to satisfy you, and it's not any other kind of a funny brain mechanism. It's what is in front of you. <clears throat> so, we did this soup experiment. And... Uh, my kids built this little table for me, and we set up the whole apparatus, had four bowls of soup on a table and a pot, and said, eat all the soup you want, take more from the pot if you want. Nobody ever did. They ate their bowl, and they finished. And then when we got done, we recorded how much they had eaten, and then we lifted up the skirt of the table and showed them that these two bowls were being fed with a tube from the pot. So they never emptied. So there was one subject that came in, ate, 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 ate down to the bottom, and then he called me and said, Dr. Painter, there's something moving in my bowl. <laughs> I said, no, really, there's not. He said, look, look, there's something moving right there. Said, look at that. I say, pay no attention to the artesian well in your bowl. Just eat. <laughs> and, and so he, he ate, and he ate over a quart of soup. <laughs> and I said to him afterwards, what were you trying to do? He said, I was just trying to finish my bowl. <laughs> But he couldn't finish the bowl because he had to eat the entire two-gallon pot. <laughs> and I had, I had another subject come in, sat down and started chatting. Now, I had, this was tomato soup, and I had to get the soup flowing from the pot into the bowls, get it going, bring people in and start eating. And this person started talking, and the bowl starts rising. <laughs> then about a minute and a half, the bowl is flowing over the top. You can see how hard my life is. These studies are not easy. So this is what happened. When we had the refillable bowl, people ate almost twice as much soup. You use that bowl as a visual cue to tell you how much to eat. When you take the bottom of the bowl away, you lose track and you eat twice as much. And here's the amazing part of this, really. They estimated they ate the same amount. So there's a guy sitting across from you, eats a quart of soup. <laughs> How much you eat? Oh, we had about the same bowl of soup. <laughs> you can't even tell when the guy's eating a quart. How much you have? Oh, about a bowl. <laughs> Isn't that a little scary to, to how flighty we are and how we make decisions? You know, and how much it depends on stuff we don't even know it's dependent on. All right. I had uh, Paramount Farms, the pistachio people, call me up about two years ago and said, we saw your candy experiment. We put candies on the desk and then we put candies in the desk, and then we did one with candies on the desk, and we left wrappers on the desk to show people how much they had eaten. Because candy kisses, now, now they are evil. <laughs> you know, I can, eat, I can just eat candy kisses and never stop. And so if you put the, the wrappers by the candy kisses and leave them sitting out, it gives you a visual cue of how much you've had, and you tend to eat less. Good idea. Be messy. They said, if you leave shells out of pistachios, would you eat less? I said, I don't know. Give me $30,000. I'll test it. And they did. <laughs> and so, so I had a popular, I had 129 college students. As they entered the room, a couple of classes we did this in, we gave them shelled nuts one time. We gave them nuts in the shell the next time. Pick all you want, eat all you want, and have a good time in class. This is what happened. They chose about the same volume of, of nuts. You have to peel the nuts so they ate a little bit less. And because you don't eat the shell, usually. <laughs> Unless you want a really, really high fiber diet. They ate half as many calories. So once again, they ate half as many calories and they didn't know it. I asked them, now this means nothing. If these people went home starved and, and just went home and ate and ate and ate, then what good did it do you? So I asked them, are you full? Are you satisfied? They're equally full. 
equally satisfied, and ate 50% less. How would you like to eat less and not know it? Wouldn't that be good? So then we did this, st this study with uh, faculty, because you can always fool faculty. They're not very smart. I can say that I'm a faculty member. No moaning. So one day we left the empty shells on the table visible, and the next we cleared them. So we put pistachios out every couple hours, kept filling their bowl. And then one day we let the shells pile up in a bowl. And then the next day, every two hours, we cleaned it so they lost track of how much they ate. When they lost track of how much they ate, they consumed an extra 120 calories just by clearing the shells off of the table. Once again, we ask them, are you full? Are you satisfied? Equally full, equally satisfied, and ate 120 calories different. Now, when I did this, I came up with a brilliant idea. I thought, I thought it was brilliant. And the pistachio people loved it because it made them a million dollars. I came up with an idea. I called it the pistachio principle. It would be an interesting thing for you to go home tonight and Google pistachio principle. You will find a hundred references from Russia to Brazil on people that have caught on to this idea of the pistachio principle. And I just made it up one day, sit in my office when I ran out of things to do. And the, the pistachio principle is this. When you want to lose weight, you need less calories, right? If you're going to lose weight. And so the logical thing that you think is, I need to restrict calories. So usually when we want to lose weight, we end up saying, I am never going to eat chocolate again. No fried foods for me. Or, this is the big one, I'm not going to eat any carbs. <laughs> Good for you. I'm not going to have any carbs. Great. You make that decision to restrict carbs. What do you think of that night? Carbs. When you wake up in the morning, what do you think about? Yeah, well, I want toast and cereal. And the next week, what do you think about? Carbs. Next month, what do you think about? Should you make it to the next month, what are you thinking about? <laughs> Carbs. And so, when you restrict something, you begin to crave it. And you eventually go back to eating it almost every time. And so, diets don't work because we restrict things. Here's the pistachio principle and what I just showed you today. And you can tell me if it works. You can go try it. The pistachio principle is this. You're going to have calorie reduction without restriction by changing your dining environment. Now, you go home and you switch bowls to small bowls. You wake up the next morning, man, I'm craving those big bowls. <laughs> the next morning, you wake up the next day thinking, man, I remember those. Do you remember those, honey? Those big bowls we used to have? It's so sad. Now we've got these little dinky bowls. I don't know if I, I, don't know if I can handle it anymore. The bowls are so little. <laughs> You get my point. You're a good group. You just chuckle out there. <laughs> so the pistachio principle, doing these things I just mentioned, making things visible or out of sight that you don't want, making them hard to get if you don't want it, making smaller plates, bowls, cups. Do you remember you know, a juice glass? When you used to go out to a restaurant, they used to have juice glasses that were this big. They were five ounces, six ounce glasses. And those don't even exist anymore. When you go and get a small glass, you get eight to 12 ounces. You get a large glass, it's 12 to 16 ounces. Juice glasses used to be one half of a cup. They're not anymore. Now, this is my last point tonight, and I have uh, three minutes left uh, before we have to go. And so I had a friend of mine one time. He pulled out something out of his pocket, wrote it down, put it back in his pocket. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm recording what I eat. And I went, oh, brother, what is this? Some kind of a health food fix. And he goes, yeah, a dietitian told me. Really? I said, he said, you write it down before you put it in your mouth? Yeah. And, and, and so he said, how much did you lose? He said, I lost 90 pounds. Really? How long did you keep it off? Five years. Five years! So I went looking in the literature and this is what I found. Here's a study with consistency. This is people who wrote it down poorly, better, better, best recorders right here. This is a non-holiday week and so you gained weight if you didn't record it. You started recording, you lost weight, lost weight, you recorded everything, you lost even more weight. And then during a holiday, you record it, you gain weight because turkey is good <laughs> and dressing and cranberry sauce and gravy. Okay. And you record it, you still gain weight. You record it better, you still... You record every single thing on a piece of paper before you put it in your mouth, you lose weight even during a holiday. First time I saw that, I thought, you know, I really don't buy this because I don't believe anything. And, uh, and so I said, there, I went looking and there's more. Here's another study. Same kind of a thing. The dotted line is the, is the, is the uh, comparison group. So we said, you're going to be watched. They started losing weight. And then they forgot they were being watched and they, and they gained a little bit of weight. And then the holiday came and they pigged out. And then the holiday ended, and they kept pigging out. 
and they stopped when they thought, I hate myself and I'm evil. I, my pants don't fit anymore and I can't stop myself. I hate myself. And then you start losing weight, but you've gained two pounds. And so here's the people start writing it down. They lost weight drastically. The holiday came. They, killed, they step, kept losing weight, but not as much. It ended. They kept losing weight until they stopped recording and then they leveled off. And so I'm going to create something called Painter's Pencil and Paper Diet. I'm going to charge you 10 bucks for it. <laughs> and it's going to open up and it's going to say, write it down, stupid. <laughs> and then it's going to be a blank book. And you just write it down and keep it in your pocket. It is probably, to me, I think, probably the most helpful thing you can do to help you. Because you see, nothing helps us lose weight or eat better if it does not affect us at the point of consumption. And when you do this, you make a decision not to eat it right then. You can have it in five minutes or 10 minutes or tomorrow or the next day, so you don't crave it. You just said, you know, it works really good. You do this, try, go home and try this. Take a piece of paper, write it down. And then you write stuff down. At the end of the, end of the day, I'm sitting there in front of the TV watching the Olympics. Sad to say they're over. But yeah, I'm sitting there watching the Olympics thinking, you know what? I am, I am really such a poor, suffering soul. And I, and I haven't treated myself all day. And I think I'm going to eat M&Ms. And then I pull out the thing going, oh my goodness, look at that. I've had ice cream and cake and pies and cookies. I'm not going to have the M&Ms. And I choose then not to have and put it back in my pocket. And I don't eat the M&Ms. So I do think it is a really great key to have this whole thing work. So here's Glamour Magazine. It came out uh, two years ago. And one of my faculty, a young lady, came and threw on my desk and said, Dr. Payne, look at this. And I looked down and said, what good sex means to a guy? <laughs> and Danielle said, no, that's not it. What are you talking about, Danielle? I looked back down and says, it says, uh, sex predator expose. I said, Danielle, what are you talking about? And by now, it's five seconds. And she's petrified. And I felt bad and, and said, I'm in a hurry. What's and she said, get your happy weight. OK. Don't overhaul your whole diet, make small changes. Perfect. As soon as you say the words, I'm going on a diet, you've already failed. Why? Because you're strict. Because you're strict. Now, what, when you, what's inherently there in the word diet? diet. Temporary. I'm going to diet until I can get into this cute bikini. And then, brother, after I get done with that, what am I going to do? Go back to eating the way you did before. And do you gain weight? Yes. So diets don't work. I'm thinking these people have got it down. I am so pleased with this magazine. Very frustrating magazine, though. I couldn't even find the article. There's no index. There's pictures. All, I hate it. OK. <laughs> Diets don't work. Perfect. Repeat these words, says Dr. Painter, until you truly believe them. I want to get to my happy weight <laughs> and stay there forever. I don't want to make huge changes, just small ones consistently. <laughs> Such a simple mind trick won't work. This guy's an idiot. You might have to do something. And so what did I say? I probably said this. Make this a mantra for your life. Don't make big changes. Make small ones. And she said, make it a mantra for you. OK. <laughs> if you just do this, it works. Don't make big changes. Make small ones consistently. It works. If you do it, it works. Now, here's what we said tonight. Uh, Self-monitoring really helps us control consumption. And you see I put my email address, jepainter at eiu.edu. If you email me, I'll send it to you. Smaller packages decrease consumption. Out of sight, out of mind. Inconvenience decreases it. Food labels decrease it. Visual cues to satiation influence consumption. And I think it works. I hope you do too. Now, I should have left time for questions, but uh, since I'm staying in the hotel, I can answer them until midnight. And, uh, but I'll let you go. Now, we've just begun a relationship, you and I. Iowa. <laughs> this may be my first time in Iowa. I went to Upper Iowa College in Fayette, Iowa, my first year of school. Anybody from there? Fayette? Are you? So that was my first college. I got drunk a lot when I was there. <laughs> I gave up drinking way after that. So <laughs> last year. So if you want this presentation, one way we can keep in touch here is that I'll send it to you. I'd be happy to do that. If you Google portion size me, some good things will come up. And so see if it does. Um, I want to thank Anna, who's back there with the microphone. This, is, well, this, this may be the first time in my whole life that an undergraduate student has gotten me to a university, and I didn't talk to anybody else. I mean, I go all over the place. But Anna, thanks for bringing me. I wouldn't be here. She heard me. Uh, no problem. She heard me at a talk two years ago and just was persistent until she got me here. And so thanks to, to her for getting me here. And uh, if I do these experiments all the time, if you're an undergraduate and you think, I would love to do experiments like that, 
I always need a good graduate student. I have about 120 in our program. And we, and we have about 20, 25 dietetic students doing internships, their dietetic internship. And they are the ones that helped me do this research. If you'd like to do that, I'd be happy to chat with you. As a matter of fact, my ministry, some people, when you go to church, they help the poor. You know, or they take, go to visit sick people. My ministry is I feed students. <laughs> I'm taking a group of students to Italy, as I told you, and uh, I have a group going in June, and it's not full. June 11th to the 27th, and I actually need more people to go. So if you think you might want to go to that, I'd be happy to stand around here and chat with you afterwards and talk about that. If you'd like to learn about the program, I'd be happy to take you out to a Starbucks or Caribou or whatever you have here and sit down over coffee and tell you about the program. If you want to hang around, I'd be happy to hang here because I'm just going to go to my room and uh, work on email. Now, before I let you go, is there any question that's just burning that uh, you'd like to ask in front of everyone? I mean, it might be. Yeah. Yes. I am assuming that there was no change in the standard of what is obese. Right, no change. So that increase in obesity chart that I showed in the very beginning, it's the same standard all the way through, looking at uh, the BMI of people that are obese. And so that's the same. Yes? Colorado did change. They just changed slower than everybody else. If you have a question, you can get her microphone back there, if you have it. Any other questions? She's got one over there. You want to run over there? Anna? She just wants you to record it because apparently it's being recorded and she wants it on tape. Oh, okay. Um, as college students with the plates and portions already pretty much made for us, how can we make changes, you know, eating at dining centers? You know what? I eat out 50% of the time and I haven't gotten too fat yet. And it is because I practice some of the things when I travel. And one of the things is my wife takes, when she gets a whole bowl of plate, plate of stuff, she takes off part of it. If they give her too much, she saves it for later. She doesn't eat it. You have to make the changes before you sit down and put it in front of you. And you can do that even in the dining center. Because a lot of times, what's plumped on there is they're doing it when you're watching them. And you can tell them how much you want. And they can make, put less. You can pile everything onto one plate. You know, salad, dessert, milk. Put it all in one plate. <laughs> Okay, so you can work on that. Any other questions? I'm going to be around here for as long as you want to stay in chat. Like I said, I'd be happy to take you out if you want to. Thanks for coming. We do have these little packets of raisins. If you want to grab some as you go out, thanks to the California Raisin Board.